Week three of our observation beehive experiment is complete. Still no queen sighting, despite our best and patient efforts. However, our bees are showing all the right signs that she will soon be making her royal appearance on the outside of our frames. Did you know that honeybees have their own version of the game Twister? Get ready for a game of festooning. And get your baking hat on because today we will be making some bee bread. And finally, a spring heat wave has settled in over the hive as the late April temperatures hit the 90s. It's hot. It's time to turn on the air is conditioner in the beehive. In or is it just me? It's hot. It's getting hot, all right, and week three is behind us. It's quiet and still in the observation hive as the light of a new day dawns on the red mountain that towers over the alfalfa field that is next to the shed that shelters the hive that is home to our bees. To survive, a colony of bees must adapt to the extremes in year-round temperatures, from the hot summer days in excess of 100 to the cold freezing winters well below zero. And it's not a matter of just comfort for the bees. It's a matter of survival for the colony. Think of a colony of bees as a giant incubator with tens of thousands of young developing bees inside. In the busy spring and summer months, the queen will lay over a thousand eggs daily, every day. And it will take almost three weeks before fully developed worker bees will emerge from their individual cells. In order for the young bees to successfully survive the development process in their private cells, the temperature within the hive must remain a constant 95 degrees. Even fractional variations in temperature will result in disaster and tens of thousands of young bees will be ruined. To maintain the temperature inside the hive, certain bees will strategically position themselves throughout the hive face a certain direction and fan their wings in place, thus creating a flow of air throughout the hive. This is no different than what is done in homes as fans and or open windows are used to circulate air throughout the house, allowing hot, stagnant air to be circulated out of the house. The numbers of bees and the placement of the bees throughout the hive will vary depending on how much air must be moved to maintain the proper 95 degree temperature. In our observation hive, there are several air vents on the sides of the hive and one at the top. Notice, perfectly aligned bees are positioned inside the hive, fanning their wings in such a way that they are literally pulling air through the vent causing the air to flow and move through the hive. Out of our sight, however, are the other bees stationed elsewhere in the hive to keep the air moving. Additionally, when the days become excessively hot, a large number of bees abandon foraging for nectar and pollen, and they turn their efforts towards bringing back stomachs full of water. In tiny droplets, the bees will spit out the water throughout the hive creating an additional level of evaporative cooling. And fanning has one additional purpose other than maintaining temperature in the hive. When a worker bee collects nectar from a flower, the nectar is between 70 and 95% water. Honey is 17% water. Therefore, the water content of the nectar and enzyme mix that is deposited into the cell has far too much water in it. The airflow created by the network of fanning bees also causes the excess water to be evaporated from the honey. When the honey has the perfect water content, the bees cap and seal each cell to preserve the perfect water content. When a colony of bees is in the stage of drawing out the honeycomb on the frames like ours is right now, the bees engage in a behavior called festooning. A festoon is a cluster of bees hanging leg to leg in sheets between the bottom of the frames, forming a beautiful interconnected lacework. The design is often only one layer of bees thick, and the design is open and airy. The purpose of a festoon is unknown. Scientists and beekeepers have a variety of explanations for this behavior, but the fact is, festooning remains one of those 
unbelievable mysteries to this day. Everyone knows that bees collect nectar, and everyone knows that bees collect pollen. And it goes without saying that the liquid nectar is what the bees magically turn into delicious honey. However, ask someone what the purpose of the pollen plays in making the honey, and most people will look up, think for a moment, and say, Well, let me fill you in. Pollen is high in protein. Honey is a carbohydrate. All of those developing young bees that I mentioned earlier require a tremendous amount of protein to develop. Bees fill the pollen baskets on their high legs with a load of pollen and return it to the hive. A certain area of the comb toward the top of the frame is designated by the bees for pollen deposits. The foraging bee returning to the hive with her basket full of pollen, locates the designated cells, positions herself over the designated cell, rubs her hind legs together and drops the two loads of pollen into the cell. She will then head back out of the hive to gather another load. Another bee will quickly dive headfirst into the cell and begin to mix the pollen with honey and nectar, turning it into bee bread. This protein-rich bee bread is what designated nurse bees will feed the developing young bees. The outside of the frames of our observation hive are beginning to follow this pattern. The comb has been drawn out so that the cells are sufficiently deep. And now portions of the frame are beginning to be filled with pollen, well, bee bread. This is why I know that the queen is only days away from paying us a royal visit. The deposits of pollen on a frame of comb is a sure sign that the queen will soon be visiting that frame. That royal visit will be one of the most amazing things in nature you will ever witness. And I promise you, it is only days away. Only feet away from the outside entrance for our bees sits a log that I use as a stool. After the hot sun has disappeared behind the hills to the west of our hive, my favorite thing to do is to sit on that log face to face with our bees and watch them quietly descend from the sky and return to the hive for the night after a hard day of foraging, literally from sun up to sun down. Hidden among the thick trees only a hundred yards from our hive is the shallow, slow-flowing Santa Clara River. Cool, fresh air from the river drifts towards the hive as a chorus of crickets and toads begin to sing. This is when I wish time could stand still. The other evening, as it grew dark and I sat observing and pondering on my stump, my wife brought me a pillow and a blanket. It was the best night's sleep I've had in a long time. 